Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for waiting um, quite late into the evening um, to hear these sort of presentations. One of the, the disappointments, or if you like, the benefits of speaking seventh in a line of speakers is you sit there and watch all your slides uh, and all the points you wish to make appear before you. Um, and so um, some of the, my slides I will go through rather quicker because I, I think we've already covered them. Um, but it's also very comforting to know that what I'm going to speak to you about, there is nothing different. Um, that might be a disappointment to you. Um, maybe you were hoping that we were going to come up with some new ideas, some new thoughts. But I think what we're finding is the tried and tested practices uh, that we all sort of speak about are really the only way forward. But what I want to try and do to you, for you is, is talk to you a little bit as a practical approach um, to energy efficiency. Uh, I'm saying we are where we are today. As has already been said, um, what is driving this forward? It is the environmental agenda. And when we look at the environmental agenda, what are the questions that are going on for a ship owner at the moment? What will be regulated? When and what for? Will I win or lose? You know, are my customers or the other stakeholders, there's going to be risks there. How much will compliance cost? Everybody's talking about these new ideas and these new thoughts. And at the end of the day, we know that this industry is suffering. We know at the moment that the freight rates and the profit margins are really down at the bottom. So what we don't want to be sitting here is saying, oh, well, spend this and do that or do everything else. But it is coming. Um, and again, one of the interesting debates that's going on at the moment, the environmental agenda that is driving all this, is the fact that we are talking about saving fuel and CO2 emissions and a reducing energy usage. And at the same time, we've got a piece of legislation, the ballast water uh, legislation sitting there in the background, will soon be implemented. We've got the socks and knocks and the scrubber debate that going on. Now, both of those pieces of legislation, if they come into force and you put in technological solutions to resolve those issues, you're going to increase your energy usage because all of those systems need energy usage. So at one stage, we've got the environmental lobby saying, save the water, save the air, save this, save that. Um, and then at the same time, they're bringing in systems we're bringing in systems that is increasing this whole sort of debate. So it's a difficult time for ship owners at the moment. So what are you going to do? Um, are you going to make the right technological decisions? That, as, as was mentioned earlier, if you fitted every one of the energy saving devices that are on the market today, we would be selling electricity and, and power back to the national governments. Uh, because they all say if you fit this one, it's 3%, that one, 4%, that one, 8%. Uh, and so what is the right technological decisions? Uh, what are the risks? Again, we talked about, about too early or too late. Um, I, I really don't know that there will be a flag state authority that will be brave enough to stand up and offer dispensations for EEDI. I, I really don't know that anybody will be out there and saying it. And then also, if you act later, we know that we've got this next tranche of 10% reductions later on. So are you going to sort of make the situation worse? And it, and it is a, it's a very complex sort of situation at the moment. But I, what I would say is we are here. There is no good griping about it. We're not going to change the direction of IMO. We're not going to change the direction of the EU. Uh, because I've been in this industry for 43 years. And for 43 years, I have heard that shipping is the most environmentally means of transport there is. Per tonne mile, that is true. That is true. But we can no longer, not necessarily hide behind that, but we have to face up to our responsibilities for our children, the planet, and everything else that goes with it. Um, and again, so what are the risks long-term capital? And can I create a competitive edge? Can I use energy management? And we've just seen ISO 50001 being used as a competitive edge. So a lot of these things, if you, if you implement them, take them forward, there is a chance to differentiate your business. Because if we think when we are buying from shops, what are the things that drive us? We look for something different. And so you have got an opportunity with energy efficiency to differentiate your product. But at the same time, You've got to make a profit. 
You've got to reduce emissions. You've been told. Some people are saying go faster. Some people are saying go slower. The cargo suppliers want less freight on the high seas at any one time. So they're sort of saying, well, just in time delivery, let's get it there faster. We're seeing another segment that's saying go slower. You've got to remove the sulfur. You've got to clean the ballast water. Recycling ships. This is all under this environmental agenda. Save energy, lower prices, be on time, train the crew. Again, for about the last 10 years that I can remember, this industry was always talking about crew competence and crew quality and growth of crew. All of a sudden, I haven't heard that debated for, for ages. It's all now environment and energy and efficiency and saving. But a lot of these things that are going to come through are going to be reliant on these same very crew members to implement and move this forward. So we've got to think about training crew. And of course, we've got to be safe. We can't live with any environmental disaster or any safety incidents or, or any damage to, to life or property. So there's this whole conflicting goals around energy efficiency. And as I say, I've put this slide up here and we've all spoken about it. You know, Marpole, Annex 6, SOX, NOX, and I know we're not actually talking about SOX and NOX, but there are issues there. As I said, if you're going to comply with the SOX, you've either got to go for scrubbers. We've heard about using you know heavy fuel oil is the the incinerator for the oil industries but if we stop using that and we go to distillate fuels what's going to happen to that so again it's another thing in this mix that is going to to change lng will lng be a, a fuel uh, i don't know and we're, we're talking about eco areas i've heard a lot of debate that people are saying well the mediterranean needs to become an eco area that is driven by a lot of the north european ports who see that all the southern European ports are going to have a competitive advantage because all the ships are going to come into here because they don't have to comply with the, the sulfur requirements in the, in the Mediterranean. Then they're going to put it all onto into road and freight and put it up through, through Europe on, on block trains and, and um, road trucks. Is that actually the spirit? Um, so that there is still further to go on this debate, but I keep coming back to the point, we've got to do it. The SEMPs, the EDIs. Um, you'll be glad to know I'm not even going to attempt the formula or talk anything about EEDIs, uh, but I will talk a little bit about uh, energy efficiency and SEMPs. Okay, so we've seen the technical and the operational measures, EEDI, SEMP, EEOI. Um, I will talk a little bit about SEMP, but I'm not going to talk EEDI. And I've heard very little today said about EEOI. Um, and that's a, another interesting debate in, in its own self because it's a function of the amount of cargo as you actually carry. Um, so people have talked about monitoring your EEOI, but you know, on a ballast leg and you're not carrying any cargo, you've got a zero EEOI. Um, and if the business and the market is down and you're carrying less cargo for a particular reason, that's going to affect your EEOI. So you're going to have these these, these spikes, spikes around it. And then the market-based measures, and we've had a very good presentation on all the various market-based measures, but the feedback I got from MEPC 63 the other day um, in a document that I saw basically said, yes, but it ain't going to happen. Because everybody's got a point and everybody's arguing. Um, and to be quite honest, I can't see market-based measures being sorted out within IMO and coming into any sort of practical form for a long time. And we all know how IMO can move forward and the politics that go on and the, the horse trading that goes on within IMO. So are market-based measures going to be a realistic thing in, in the near future? I don't think so. Speed limits. You know, this 15 knots maximum, 15, 14 knots minimum. Is it really going to work? I, I, I don't know. Who's going to police it? Who's going to manage it? Um, I, you know, I've got a motor car, then there are speed limits on the road. Do I ever bother with them? You know, I do occasionally. Um, but, you know, people are going to try to make a competitive advantage. You're going to have a speed limit of 15 knots. You know, industries are going to go 15 knots. And somebody's going to do 15 and a half. You know, and somebody else is going to do 16. And then they're going to say, well, I was only steaming 15 knots through the water but the, the wind was behind me and the tide was behind me and that was my benefit and then there'll be a smart person with a calculation. And so, again, I, I'm not putting these systems down 
but I am telling you that they are being worked on, they are being talked about, and at some point, something will come out of it. But right at the moment, you need to keep your businesses in operation. That's the number one fact. I, I had a chairman once who used to say to me, we're in business to make a profit. Never be ashamed to say it. And that's the truth for this industry. We're in business to make a profit. So let's look at what we've got to deal with and how we can make benefit of it. So, and again, just coming back, before I move on to that, this issue of a billion tonnes of CO2, 3.3% of the total global emissions. I come back to this, you know, we are the most environmentally friendly, and I accept all that, but this amount of CO2 emissions is exactly the same as some small countries in the world that are having to comply with the Tokyo um, Kyoto Convention and the various other conventions. So we can't bury our head in the sand. We talked about Richard Branson's carbon war room. Um, so the reason that that is being worked in that particular fashion is to prove how environmentally friendly aviation is. Because they're listing all the bad other sort of sections. And, and, and we're not so good at playing this sort of political game, but we're going to have to do something. Um, so it will save greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But at fuel oil at $740 a tonne today, if you can burn less of it, you are saving money. That's the, that's the brutal fact. Now, people will say to me, my ship is on charter, I don't pay for the fuel, therefore it's, it's not an issue. Um, but I'm afraid that ain't going to work anymore because charterers are going to start asking these sort of questions. So if you can save fuel, you will meet the greenhouse gas emissions and you will save fuel costs. And you need systematic and dedicated effort to realise saving potentials. I'm not going to talk to you about energy efficiency and I haven't got a silver bullet here. I haven't got something that nobody in this room has ever thought of before. We've seen all the lists of all the things you've got to do. And anybody who's been in shipping um, for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever the length of time, will have seen all these initiatives and said, yep, done that, did that in the 70s, did that in the 80s, oh yeah, we've done that. Yeah, that, well, of course, we did that. But what we have as an industry have been terrible at doing is actually measuring our success. Because I remember sailing on container ships, those really bad things we've been told about, um, carrying two and a half thousand TEUs, burning 400 tonnes of fuel a day. Two and a half thousand, 400 tonnes. Now we're moving six and a half thousand TEUs at 250 tonne a day. You know, the, the 12,000, the 18,000. Shipping has done a magnificent job of becoming environmentally friendly. We, are, we have been tremendous. We've moved miles, but we as an industry can't prove it. And if you can't measure it, then you can't prove it. And so that's what we've got to do when it comes to, to energy efficiency. Now, I've put up on that slide, there are three guides. DMV has produced fuel-saving guidelines for tankers, for bulk carriers, and container ships. These guides are basically a listing of all the whiz-bang modern technology that is out there. Muir's duck, Becker rudders, you name it, it's all in there. And it gives you an indication of how those might affect the operation of your ship, how you can invest in them. Um, there's a little tool in there which is a return on investment calculator. And as I said, it is a tool, but it is mainly meant for those ships that you are planning to build in the future. Should we fit this? Should we fit that? What is going to be the benefit? Do you fit, you know, you're not going to fit a Muse Duck to a 23 knot container ship. It, you know, where is the benefits? All these sort of things. You will, you, it helps you sort of move forward there. So those guides are out there and your local DMV office will be more than happy to talk to you on those. But that's not actually what I'm going to talk about technology. What I am going to talk about is how do you improve energy efficiency? There's basically more efficient operations, and again, we've, we've talked about it, weather routing, energy consumers, speed optimization, trim. Um, more efficient technologies, that's the bit that I've just parked to one side. Fuel shifts, what's going to happen there. Improved infrastructure, we've heard of the BP uh, product, you know, um, 
just-in-time arrival or whatever it is. DMV have something called synchro port. There's a lot of these ideas about that. How they're going to work and with different operations. But basically, save 12 hours on your port time and you've roughly saved half a knot on your speed. On a, a sort of a, an average length sort of uh, passage. You know, obviously, the, it, it, it's easy to calculate. But you, you can save half... Half a knot on your overall passage speed. Half a knot, and we heard earlier on, you save, you take it down one knot and you're talking 10 or 12%. So if you could save half a knot, so all of these things can be done. Um, and it's improved cooperation between players. Again, time and time I speak to companies and they say to me, oh, but I don't pay for the fuel. Or well, that's the chartering department. Or well, that's the operations department. Or no, no, that's, no, that's not our responsibility. No, we're, we're not interested in this. We as an industry have got to get our act together. Again, I go back to my, my days in, in container ships and I remember being in port and being told to wait for five late running containers uh, prior to sailing from Southampton because these were our most important clients' containers. Now in container ship world, when you talk about your most important client, that means the person who's paying the lowest freight rate because he's your biggest client and therefore he's got huge reductions. Um, so we stayed, and then we've got to get to the Suez Canal to make our transit, so we burn lots of fuel. And then when you actually say to the marketing guys, okay, how much freight rate did we make on those five boxes, and how much um, fuel did we burn to get there? And they said, well, I don't know. Yeah, he's an important client, you know, we'd lose him. And so they came to a conclusion at that time, they said, okay, the next time it happens, we're going to shut them out. We're going to shut those boxes out. We're going to say to the guy, no, we're not going to carry them. And the, the, the sales teams were pulling their hair out, you know, we're going to lose our biggest client, you know, oh God, you know, what are you doing to us? And the reality was that that client just suddenly woke up to the fact that P&O Ned Lloyd, who I was working for, they're not going to accept late running boxes anymore. We better get there on time. Because they don't shift to somebody else because they're already paying you a low freight rate. You know, so these sort of things that have a way that if you can just get people talking together, and again, if, you, if the ship is, the fuel is chartered by somebody else and it, it, it's bought in, don't sit there and say, oh, it's nothing to do with us. Go to your charterer, talk to them. How can you share the savings? What are the potentials? Be proactive. Because we talked about how you're going to differentiate your ship and <coughs> what are you going to do and how you're going to make a benefit to all these sort of things. And, and if you can get these dialogues and things going, then, then there's a hope. Do shout at me when... How long? Five minutes. I'm sorry, I have a problem with talking too long. Um, energy efficiency. <laughs> energy efficiency. What do we DMV suggest? Again, there's nothing new here. These six slides are exactly the same as you've seen in another format. But what we are saying is you need to look at them all holistically. Don't look at them in isolation. Don't just say, well, I'll pick that one and I'll pick that one and I'll pick that one. Choose them get them right and look at them all together. Because in a company, who actually owns the fuel? Is it the finance department? Is it the technical department? Is it the chartering department? Who actually owns the fuel? And what we found is that nobody is fully accountable for the fuel in any company. Yeah, well, it's, it's somebody's pocket, but how much do you use and where do you take it from? So again, so, some interesting conundrums there. And as I said to you, I, there's a lot more slides and the presentation will be on YouTube, I understand. So with one eye on the clock, I'm not going to finish this. But of all these lists down here, most of these are common knowledge. But what we see in companies is a failure to meet to get to the end. Again, I worked in a, worked in a company where we had new paint systems put on the ship. International came in and said, paint your ship with this, you're going to save a fortune and everything else. We duly did it. After two and a half years, they came back to us and said, you know, dry dock, are you going to repaint the ship with this paint? You know, it's the best thing out. What did you save? And I said to the technical manager, what did we save? He said, one dry dock paint cost. You know, there was no sort of follow through and we find this time and time with, with, with companies. So. Energy management, th th we've got this huge commitment. Everybody's going talking energy management. It's the sexy subject at the moment. Um, so we're all going to go off and do new things and become energy gurus. And then week after next, somebody's going to say, what happened to that thing about energy management? 
What's going on with it? And what we're saying is you've got to carry on. You've got to invest. You've got to move forward. You've got to have something to drive it. Maybe it's the scent. Maybe it's ISO 15001. Maybe it's just a big stick or threatening to fire somebody in a company. But whatever you do with this initiative that's moving forward, do not just tick a box. You know, when it comes to the SEMP, don't just say, I'm going to do the mere minimum. You know, I could write a SEMP here. We could write a SEMP, actually, for all of our companies in the next half an hour. We have an A4 piece of paper and we could write a SEMP that will meet the requirements. It doesn't meet the ambition. It doesn't meet, you know, the intent. But that's the reality. There will be some companies that are out there that will do that. However, if you use your SEMP as a tool to look at the six things we've talked about, to drive through within the company, to see where your energy losses are. Because when you buy fuel, you buy energy and you lose it. So find out where the hell it's going. Um, so, general observations from general uh, energy efficiency studies. We have some technical quick wins. Company culture is the highest factor which will influence. If there's no motivation and there's no enthusiasm, your, your energy efficiency programs are going to sort of run into the buffers. Um, companies are set to run operations, not necessarily improvement projects, so you need to think about that and how it's going to work. We talked about dedicated personnel, prerequisite to get energy efficiency, how it's going to move forward. Um, and as I say, attention is often low in companies not paying the fuel. I am going to stop at this point because I'm... Could you... I will give you two minutes to present yeah, quickly. Right. In, uh, I've been given two minutes. Um, okay. You have triple in, uh, yeah, I'm going to... Um, there's a lot of stuff in my presentation on SEMP, and you'll be glad to see it's the same as the other guys. Triple E. What is triple E? Triple E is not the Maersk 18,000 TEU container ships. Uh, we had the registered trademark before they started using it, uh, but we decided it wasn't necessarily a good marketing advantage to discuss that with Maersk. So Maersk have the triple E container ships, but triple E is a DMV's environmental energy and efficiency rating scheme. How do you differentiate? If you're going to go into this, how are you going to have something that makes your product stand out? DMV proposed this at North Shipping about two years ago this environmental rating scheme. It's a voluntary rating scheme. If you buy any white goods at the moment and you go into the electrical store, there's a sticker on it. It'll tell you it's an A, B, C, D, E. DMV came forward with this idea of a voluntary rating scheme numbered four to one to four. It's a transparent system on reliable data. It helps you prepare for green rules. It's a branding tool, and we're going to talk, green shipping coming up, talk to us next, and um, we sort of believe it's, it's a tool that can be used in this, and it's an opportunity and not a threat. Um, I forget, these are all the customers that are looking for it. But anyway, what is it? It's level one is leading, sustained, uh, systemized, uh, and heightened awareness. It's basically very much like the TMSA stepping stones, if, if we're honest. Um, and it's looking at environmental fuel efficiency, energy efficiency, and these are the things that are involved in that. If you can see that, um, SEMP, EEOI, STEMP establishment, calculation of EEOI, quality testing of fuel use. So it has various stages within the, the, the triple E sort of tool. There's a lot more in the, this sort of presentation which will go online. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.